<laughs> okay, welcome everyone to the Criminology Forum Speaker Series. We are very lucky today to have with us Dr. Reese Hester, who, as I was saying, is at Clemson now, but he has deep Penn State roots, having been a research professor here and serving as deputy director uh, at the Sentencing Commission and currently working as a visiting scholar with the Sentencing Commission. So you might not be surprised to learn that one of his key research interests is sentencing, punishment, corrections, but he's also a legal scholar and looks into a lot of legal stuff that I don't understand. So I'll let him talk more about that, <laughs> especially the Fourth Amendment and issues surrounding search and seizures. Uh, most recently, he is working with the National Institute of Justice on a project to revalidate the pattern risk assessment instrument. And this is part of the First Step Act that was passed in 2018. So he continues to be very influential in the policy world within and outside of Penn State. So I will gladly turn the floor over to him and let him tell you a little bit more about these projects. Thank you so much. I'm gonna try to share the screen. Okay, that's working? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about criminal history enhancements and sentencing guidelines, which is um, really the, the basis of my visiting scholar position. I'm working with the Sentencing Commission again. Um, I've been studying prior record enhancements and sentencing guidelines for several years now. Um, and so this talk is really uh, trying to um, cover a couple of different uh, studies that I've been a part of um, in kind of this broader research trajectory on prior record enhancements and hopefully um, making towards the end uh, some broader assessments of what the Pennsylvania Commission is doing for some new eighth edition amendments to the guidelines um, based on some of this research. Okay. I'm going to start with a quote from Shakespeare that I stole from a co-author, Julian Roberts of Oxford. Um, Men's evil manners live in brass, their virtues we write in water. I was recently asked to do um, a chapter for well, one of your uh, alumni, Michael Light, along with Ryan Keen. Um, Jeff, I think you're doing a chapter in that Oxford Handbooks series, and they gave me the title does criminal history matter too much in sentencing, which is a quite a prescriptive title, um, <laughs> uh, maybe a little more than most social scientists would be comfortable with, but I'm okay with it. Um, so what I thought I'd do is uh, kind of explore this issue of writing people's history in brass and continuing to punish them for the things they've done in the past continually. And just um, make time permitting, I'll get to, to all four of these, but these are just a couple of studies that I've done uh, related to prior record. And um, instead of saying that criminal history definitely does matter too much, maybe I'll hedge a little bit and say, here's a couple of reasons why it's possible that criminal history might uh, matter too much in sentencing guidelines jurisdictions. So I'll start out with a little bit of background um, and then go through a couple of these uh, studies and then make my way towards um, giving you an overview of what the commission is currently interested in doing. All right, so we'll start with some background. Uh, I know some of the people in the room are um, international experts on sentencing guidelines, but if you're not familiar, um, the concept of sentencing guideline is that when judges are going to impose punishment on an individual, uh, and maybe uh, the federal government and, a, and maybe um, 18 or 20 states have guidelines and uh, uh, the rest of the U.S. states don't, uh, but the, the concept behind a guideline where I'll put a couple more up here, that one's from Minnesota, that's the federal guidelines. That's Kansas. That's Virginia. They use a score sheet, which is a little different. The only one that really matters, though, is the Pennsylvania guy. <laughs> uh, it's colorful, color. superior <laughs> in all ways. Uh, so in non-guideline states like South Carolina, where I currently live, judges are free and they have statutory maxima. Um, and sometimes there are statutory minimums that apply. But for the most part, judges have a lot of discretion um, for something like second degree burglary. A judge could impose probation, no um, active sentence at all, all the way up to 15 years in prison, anything in between, just vast amounts of discretion. So in the 1960s and 70s, that made some people uncomfortable. 
progressives and conservatives alike seem to um, disapprove of the indeterminate system like we still have in a lot of states. Um, in states like Pennsylvania, uh, over time, the grid didn't always look like this, but developed a sentencing grid where uh, the commission, a sentencing commission, uh, basically rank orders the different offenses. And the higher up on this grid you go, the more serious the offense. And then they uh, they have this prior record score, which if you've never been in trouble before, um, you get the benefit of this far left column. Uh, these little numbers, which I'm sure you cannot see very well, but these are months in prison. And so we know for a person who um, commits robbery uh, with a threat F2 or F F1 or F2 felony, um, they would be on this line. And then we figure out what their criminal history score is and we can figure out this box. And we have a much narrower range of punishment. Uh, okay, so one way that you can try to operationalize this concept of how much do we punish a person, not because of what they did, that they're in court for today, not what you know they commit um, an assault or a burglary or whatever, but because of what they did in the past. That's what today's talk is really all about. So if I blow up just one of these lines, one of the ways that you can operationalize this is something that some colleagues of mine from um, from Oxford, Julian Julian Robertson, and also Richard Frey um, from University of Minnesota, uh, we call these prior record enhancements. And we operation one way to operationalize it is by comparing what a person is recommended when they have no prior record with what they the maximum recommendation would be if they had the full prior record. And you could turn that into a ratio. Um, for some reason, I have this uh, pictorial graphic, which has a guy with glasses and a guy with a red beard. Um, and <laughs> seems like not such a great idea uh, <laughs> but neither of them have both a beard and glasses all right so there's several of us in the room who are happy about that uh, all right so if you take the midpoint here and compare it to the maximum here it's a uh, over a six-fold increase that a person could get strictly on the basis of their prior record not because they've done something different from another person Obviously, a murderer should get a different penalty than someone who's got petty theft, but because they committed the same thing, uh, but with a higher prior record. And you could argue with whether this is a fair comparison because of some unique factors uh, under the Pennsylvania guidelines that don't show up um, in other guidelines. But even if we were to take the midpoint of this score here, uh, which I think 56 or 58, no, uh, 52. Anyway, um, it'd be about, you'd be like tripling the prior record, uh, even just going through point number five. So um, under uh, the Robina Institute, where I first got involved and interested in prior record scores, one of the things we did was to look through the comparable guidelines jurisdiction grids and come up with an overall metric of how much more a state a recommended punishment on the basis of prior record um, and these prior record enhancements. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variation. And at the low end, there's a couple of jurisdictions, North Carolina, the federal system, um, the District of Columbia, that basically going across the grid doubles your punishment. Uh, Pennsylvania was sort of the middle of the pack where you can get almost an eightfold increase. On average, for all of them, it was about seven. And Kansas led the way with a 14 times increase. So just based on your prior record, you could have your punishment doubled or quadrupled or sextupled. It gets a little awkward at this point. Uh, I think 14 is, is a um, quadra decoupling, uh, which you'll probably never have any reason to repeat uh, what the multiplier 14 is, but it's an awful lot more punishment for a person's past. The other thing we found really interesting, and we, there's a, you can get this for free, PDF on the internet, you'd probably still be overpaying for it, uh, but we came up with this little enhancement source book, um, and we looked at all these different things, di different variations, the way that states, it was just kind of fascinating as social scientists, we love variation, um, but it's interesting to see how there's no real cohesive approach to prior record score. It's an intuitive sort of thing, but states are just off on their own. And, you know, probably Kansas doesn't even realize that they're quadra, quadra decoupling 
um, punishment <laughs> on the basis of prior record in that, you know, over in North Carolina, they're merely doubling it. It's not something that they necessarily sit down and think about. Um, there's a lot of different interesting dimensions, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. I'll be happy to chat about them, uh, but I want to to move on and just to say that there's not one way of doing this. There's a lot of different ways. Um, and it's not clear that there's a lot of thought uh, in, in uh, the schemes overall. Um, and I'm gonna try to quickly get to um, a study or two, but one of the other things that we did is this project that Richard Fraser was in charge of um, was to, and, uh, he and Julian Roberts wrote a book um, called Punishing for the Past. I think it was a, uh, what the title was from uh, Oxford University Press, really explore a lot of these things. Um, and some of the reasons why this really matters is because prior record score has some, I think they're mostly unintended consequences, but some really significant consequences, like for racial disparities, for things like prison prioritization. We normally think that we reserve prison beds for the most serious, most violent um, offenders, which might not be true if we're putting people into prison because they have a prior record of a lot of nonviolent offenses. Um, it can exacerbate the problem of the aging prison population because as people rack up and get older um, uh, and rack up a prior record score, um, we're putting them in, in prison for the longest at the very time when they're the oldest that they've ever been in their life. And for life course sorts of um, theoretical things when they're probably closer to the system than they've ever been. Um, and we're punishing them more than we ever have. Uh, only lawyers would care about something like proportionality, so I probably won't say too much about that because hopefully there's no lawyers around. Um, but it is, you know, it's a, at least uh, something to consider that you could have a person under the Pennsylvania guidelines, um, a person who commits um, a, a felony level theft could end up getting more time in prison than a person who commits a robbery, which normally you would think that's not really what we would set out to design. Uh, and so for the lawyer crowd who's really into proportionality, uh, prior record enhancements can uh, can really screw with uh, proportionality. And then finally, it's just you know mass incarceration and prison costs. So a couple of little quick graphics here. Uh, this is a study by Richard Frey from 2009. It's a really great study uh, in crime and justice. Um, where he found that two, this is racial disparities, two thirds of the racial disparities um, from, on the sentencing recommendations on the Minnesota, Minnesota guidelines were attributable to the prior record score, not in, enhancements um, for severity reasons or for mandatory minimums, but that's uh, quite, a, quite a lot of accounting for racial disparity. Here's a little graphic from a study that Ryan King published in, I think it was 2019 in criminology, where uh, he, he looked at the Minnesota guidelines, and I just try to explain this just a little bit. Um, so this is this plot. His basic takeaway from this article is that one of the reasons why in the two um, thousands the punishment, the imprisonment rate, I should say, in Minnesota was getting up towards thirty percent. So thirty percent of felony offenders um, were being incarcerated in state prison instead of some other alternative. Back when the guidelines first started uh, in the 1980s, it was more like um, it was more like 15 percent. So you have over the course of a couple of decades, the rate at which judges and prosecutors imprison people in state penitentiary uh, almost doubled on its way to doubling. And one of the causal factors, according to his analysis, was that back in 1981, the average prior record score was 0.6, so not even on average um, a, a prior record of one. And then over time, probably because of this new device of sentencing guidelines and all of a sudden prosecutors had this incentive to really keep track of prior records and to push for prior records and to get convictions um, uh, on whatever they were getting a conviction on, uh, maybe even satisfy themselves with a conviction in a probation sentence on a case so they could continue to build a prior record over time. And by the uh, by 2013, the average was two. So quite a big increase in the prior record score that the average person has and quite a big increase um, in how likely a person goes to prison. Uh, and then finally, some of um, Jeff Ulmer's work, this comes from Jeff Ulmer and uh, two other alumni of this program, uh, Noah Painter Davis and my friend Lee Tinnick, who had this great article in Justice Quarterly 
uh, from 2016, where they look at the Pennsylvania guidelines and the federal guidelines and do this nice comparison. Um, and I pulled this quote, but the uh, I think the the main takeaway is that a lot of the racial disproportionality um, in different ways in the federal system and the Pennsylvania system, um, but a, a lot of the disproportionality is mediated by the guidelines recommendations themselves, what uh, Bushway and Force would, would call type B discretion, um, like um, systemic systematic discretion, not from the actors themselves, but from the grid, from the commission. Um, okay, so it matters. Um, all right, I want to try to get to number two, because that's a real social science study that I think most people will care about. And with my apologies, I'm first going to do this little historical study, but there's a really important reason why I want to talk about this one first, um, and I'll try to convince you why it's worth our time to think about it. Uh, this is, I'm quoting myself here, so that seems like bad manners, but <laughs> Uh, but it's setting up. So if you're a, if you're a sentencing person, which a lot of you are, um, then you know that prior record is important. Um, and in fact, it's been you know uh, people who observe. I don't know if anybody's heard of this. Stephen Smart guy, but uh, two legal variables: offense severity and prior record score associated most strongly with the sentencing outcome. And then uh, one of the other giants in the field, Cassie Spawn said uh, in her important 2000 piece that everybody cites, it's irrefutable that the primary determinants of sentencing decisions are the seriousness of the offense and the offender's prior uh, criminal record score. So one of the things that a person like me runs into when I'm trying to say something interesting about criminal history is like, who cares? So if I were to say, guess what? People who commit murder are sentenced more punitively than people who commit theft. We would all just sit around and go like, yeah, of course they do. And in the field, you could also, to a lesser degree, say, hey, people who have a prior record get sentenced more punitively than people who have no prior record. And scholars would go, well, it's irrefutable that that's true. Of course, they have the prior record. You're just talking yourself in a circle here. So is there really any, I mean, we just wasting 45 minutes of your time, hopefully not. Okay, so... I started to wonder about this because I ran into some contrary findings in South Carolina where I'd done some research where there are no sentencing guidelines. Um, and then I started on this Rubina project at the University of Minnesota where we were spending a lot of time based on Richard uh, and Julian's prior work, um, looking, you know, concerned about racial disparities in the prison population. Um, and at some point, I got really interested in where the grid came from anyway. And some of you would know this, uh, but if you, I had just always taken it for granted. Someone, there's a grid and some of them are colorful and it's great um, and we can study them. So, uh, so I looked into this story and ultimately I'm trying to figure out whether prior record is always irrefutable and it's, is it justified? Because in a lot of our work, we even treat prior record as a legal characteristic. Um, as if, it, of course, it matters just as much as severity, and it should. Uh, okay, so if you don't know the story, back in the 1960s, pioneers in the field of criminology and criminal justice, Leslie Wilkins, um, Don Godford, no, uh, yeah, Don Godfordson, who's um, a lot of you would be familiar with Michael, his son, uh, and uh, uh, self-control theory. Don was the founding dean at um, Rutgers, Leslie Wilkins was a professor at Albany. So these first uh, criminal justice and criminology programs that were beginning to emerge in the 1960s, instrumental um, figures in the field. So they worked on federal parole guidelines. Eventually in the 1980s, the federal system would abolish parole. And so they're um, defunct now, but they were largely touted as a success. 1960s, they had these parole guidelines. They looked sort of like a two-way matrix. They got finished with that and they said, what's next? hey, we could maybe apply some of these ideas to the front end sentencing decisions. And so they began the funded sentencing guidelines project um, where that was their task. And that's a little bit of the story that I'll tell here. Um, and then they had results and there was this the Albany method uh, by the late 1970s. And so the first sentencing commissions, which were impaneled in 78 and 79 and started um, having sentencing guidelines in the very early 80s, like Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Washington, uh, were all adopting grid-based guidelines um, influenced by this project uh, that, had, um, that had existed that flowed from this project. Okay, here's a little bit of a bastardization of a Shakespeare quote, um, but whether 
they were going to come into this sentencing guidelines project with some heuristic like a sentencing grid was never a question. Um, when I started on this journey, I just started going back and pulling all those old um, the, the journal articles that they published, but more importantly, the technical reports um, that they that they published in uh, the, associated with the, the projects that they were engaged in creating guidelines. This is way too long of a quote for me to read um, and probably for me to put on a PowerPoint slide, but I wanted to put it on there because it's just really clear from reading those formational documents that this team who are so admirable in so many ways, they showed up with a problem in search of a solution um, or uh, no, they did it the opposite. They showed up with a solution in search of a problem. Their solution was a two-way matrix. They loved it. Um, and they, this Stafford Beer was this um, kind of famous uh, British consultant who they quoted at length in one of these early formation reports. And they loved this idea. So let's not read that, but let's just think about this idea that they had, which is that sentencing is a complex arena and it involves so many considerations. You want to know so many things about victims and offenders and their prior record maybe is part of that and what they did and the circumstances and what it was like when they grew up. And there's so many things you want to take into consideration. There's a massive amount of information. And the idea from an uh, or, or orthogonal um, kind of matrix, and if you, I don't know if the younger crowd has ever held a real map in their hands or not, but like some of us who have been around, I can remember being in the back seat of the sedan and pulling out this big old map and you open it up from the from the road atlas and that's the way we travel back then it's a wonder we ever made it anywhere um and sometimes these big maps you know you're looking for whatever jefferson city and you really could like if you were just looking you didn't know where it was you could spend a lot of time these little bitty letters you got every little town in a place but the cool thing was you could flip to the index and it would say jefferson city and it would say like f2 and so then you flip it back to your map, and if you could find uh, along the, the row and then along the column where they intersect, then there would be what you were looking for. And so this idea that you can harness, right, so what he says is let's pretend there's a map with 40,000 um, uh, little squares on it. And if you were to randomly just search for what you're looking for, on average, you would search through 20,000 squares, and it would take a lot of your time. But if you knew the column and you knew the row, then you could search through just a fraction of those um, squares and you could be a hundred times quicker in your decision making. So this idea that a two-way matrix like a map um, would provide a solution for distilling massive amounts of information into something really handy was incredibly influential. They did it with the parole guidelines. They were like, this is so cool. Let's go and do it with the sentencing guidelines. All right. So I don't want to say that I'm refuting anything that Cassius Bond says is irrefutable. Um, but I at least want to show you some evidence that I dug out that maybe would cause us to revisit uh, this whole notion of why the two-way matrix is inevitable, um, or more importantly, I guess, that sentencing is always gonna be influenced or should always be influenced equally by the prior record um, as it is with, um, as with sentencing severity. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, I kind of stumbled on this before because in South Carolina, where they don't have any guidelines, prior record was really important for the in-out decision. That is, when a, when a judge make, and prosecutors uh, make the decision of whether the person is going to go to prison or not. That's one decision, a key decision that we study in sentencing. And then there's another key decision that we study in sentencing, looking at the cohort of people who are sentenced to prison, how long is their, is their prior record? So, if you're in the graduate program, you're thinking, you know, you lose a, a logistic regression for a binary decision in or out, and then something else, um, uh, ordinal, uh, or excuse me, uh, like an OLS regression or some other count um, to measure how long a person gets in prison. And what we found was that it really mattered in South Carolina for the in out, and it didn't matter for, this is crazy, like nobody else had found that, so I thought something was wrong. Um, and these were just uh, to prove it, and because in a social science building, it seems like we should show a table, uh, probably earlier along than this. Um, so criminal history, uh, the average marginal effect, uh, each criminal history category, there were five, uh, was associated with about a 13% increase in the likelihood of getting imprisoned. So pretty dramatic, you compare across the five, um, five categories. Uh, but for the prior, uh, excuse me, for the prison term, 
um, it was actually not statistically significant and was in the direction of about half um, half of a month. So it, it lined up with the idea that prior record matters for in out, but there's this question mark, why didn't it matter for um, sentence length? All right, so then looking through, like combing through all these old records and trying to piece together what where this strong uh, penchant for prior record came from. I found a few things that at least could cause us to question um, the, this, the notion here. So one example is, um, I'm gonna move through these fast and then I'll go back and talk to them in Q&A if anybody has questions, but uh, let me just rattle through them. Um, all right, so in Cook County, which was one of the pilot sites, the, uh, the architect said the length of sentence um, was not predictive in the statistical sense when they tried to like map out what the in-out decision would look like and then lay over what the prior record score and it should be 12 and then 18 and then 24, whatever they were using. Um, the length of sentences was not predictive in the statistical sense. I don't know what other sense there is than a statistical one for prediction, but anyway, in Maricopa County, they had these two decisions, in out and um, sentence length, and they had all these prior record indicators, like did they have a probation violation? Did they get incarcerated or not? Uh, how many felonies did they have? How many misdemeanors? There's 20 something of them. Um, and 21 were statistically significant on the in out decision, but only four for the sentence length decision, suggesting that there's a little something different going on. In Maryland, they try to do this, right? They try to use old data, see what judges were doing, map out where the in-out decision should be, when people should be not in prison versus prison, and then lay over on the same grid, like a, a linear increase in um, prior record length, and it didn't work. So instead, they had to use a good deal of collective judgment, and they basically said, well, if this number's 20, the next number can't be 10, we're going in the wrong direction. So they just had to make up some numbers um, that made sense understand. Overall, the team found that the, the efforts in having a single grid to represent two different decisions, in, out, and sentence length, was inconclusive and was disappointing. Nevertheless, they, they did that because judges, so they were like, hey, judges, uh, we think we're actually going to need two instruments, one to help decide in, out, and one to help decide length. And the judges said, no, we're not doing that for sure. <laughs> like, and, and there's still, I mean, we, you know, in a lot of places, you barely get one, you barely get judges to go along with the concept of sentencing guidelines. Um, and there was no way they were going to like have all these forms of, like, you guys got to figure it out, but we're not doing two. Um, all right. Other, other evidence that I'm going to kind of breeze through here. Um, but there are places where if you look back through the literature, um, very little evidence that it doesn't matter for the decision to incarcerate, but some evidence that without guidelines that a person's prior record didn't matter as much or maybe even at all for the sentence length determinations. Um, all right. Um, so let me just move on to the next study. Uh, I think the, the conclusion for me there um, is that maybe it's not as irrefutable as we've always thought, at least on the sentence length part. Um, all right, so I'll spend most of the rest of my time talking about number two um, uh, on this question of all right. So why do we why do we do that? Like every now and then, that's a good question to ask. Why are we doing what we're doing? And so if we're punishing a person triple, quadruple um, for what they've done in the past, then what's the justification? And they're justifications that are based on just desserts, um, retribution. Uh, which I'll get to if I have time, um, but also on utilitarian notions, which is what I want to spend a few minutes talking about. Okay, so probably people run into this in a variety of courses, um, but a utilitarian proposition is that the reason why we punish people is not because we're trying to uh, impose vengeance on what they did in the past, but utilitarian philosophy is all about reducing the causes or consequences of crime or harm in the future. And so rehabilitation, deterrence, incapacitation, those are all forward-looking utilitarian or some um, philosophers will call them consequentialist justifications for punishment. Okay, so maybe this is why we continue to impose more and more punishment on a person as they continue to accumulate more and more of a prior record because prior record, prior, or excuse me, I guess I should say, uh, past behavior predicts future behavior. So if your past behavior indicates that you are at a greater risk to cause um, 
crime or harm to people in the future, then maybe we should punish you more now because in doing so, we will either deter you, it's hard to make the argument for rehabilitation, but maybe you could, we'll put you in prison and give you some programming um, and that would rehabilitate you, uh, or we're gonna incapacitate you. So that brings up an empirical question for us empiricists. One, okay, well, does that actually line up? Um, and then I'll come back to this other question, which I think is overlooked, but still really important, which is even if it does line up, when we punish a person, when we double a person's punishment, what is what are we getting out of that? Are we actually reducing the causes and consequences of crime by doubling or tripling a person's punishment? Um, but first, I'll tell you a little study that I did um, on number one here. Oh, some more obscure scholars, Kramer and Ulmer, um, <laughs> once wrote that in Pennsylvania, so this is from their book on the Pennsylvania guidelines, uh, that prior record was primarily used to identify offenders who were at increased risk of committing future crimes, implying the focal concerns um, prong of community protection. Um, and so it was mostly thought of to inc incapacitate and deter. And that may not be true everywhere, and there may be people who are, uh, disagree with that. But the, but the, the thought from this, uh, which comes from the first chapter, is that severity, we think of the focal concerns, which I'm assuming you all like have in your bedroom, um, when you think of the focal concerns and we're thinking about uh, offenders' culpability and, the, and harm, uh, that that was represented in the, the rows on the grid, and that when we're thinking about public safety and community protection, that that's thought of in the columns and the prior record score on the grid, and then this grid accounts for both of them. Okay, so research question was, if we think of it this way, um, and we're thinking that each increase in prior record score is a reflection of an increased risk of recidivism, um, then can we analyze that? And you can just think of it as like a rudimentary sort of uh, risk tool. Um, and we can analyze whether increases in prior record score uh, are really um, uh, coterminous with uh, uh, increased risk of recidivism if you have recidivism data, which the commission fortunately did. All right, so I won't go a lot into the, the way this is counted um, other than to say, We've got these different levels. Um, based on the type of prior that you commit in Pennsylvania, you could get four points if it was a really serious one, or you could get three or two or one points, and that's just based on the commissions, how bad they, um, they think they are. Um, in, in Pennsylvania, we commit uh, count misdemeanors, juvenile adjudications, and felonies, um, and uh, except for one little uh, quirky thing. Generally, once you have a felony, it's counted forever. We don't stop counting them at some point. Uh, all right, so this study was based on some sentencing commission data that the commission actually used for uh, their risk assessment. Um, it contained uh, these three years of cohorts of individuals who were sentenced um, and then uh, followed up with, with recidivism data from the Pennsylvania State Police, um, about 130,000 individuals in all. Um, define recidivism as rearrest or a technical violation and recommitment to DOC um, in the three-year follow-up period. All right, so here are the measures. Um, I'm going to move through them fairly quickly. Uh, the recidivism outcome and severity of the offense from the guidelines prior record score, the type of offense, um, whether the person had multiple offenses, a control for the length of term that the person got in prison, before their release, and then um, age, race, and uh, ethnicity, gender. Two different types of analysis. I'll first uh, show you the Cox proportional hazards, a uh, survival analysis, which measures time to failure, um, and then uh, this uh, area under the curve analysis. All right, so the main findings are here. And what I'm really interested in is uh, are these increase are these different categories associated with an increased risk of recidivism? Um, the some of the highlights are with the uh, prior record score of four serving as the base category. There, you know, there's definitely some differences. Uh, Sixty-one percent of the hazard um, for a prior record score of zero. So you're, you know, a lot less likely to recidivate with a zero compared to a four. Um, and it's statistically significant. But for three and four, there's not a, a, a real difference. Um, and even between like five and six, it's pretty close. And if you do survival analysis, this is the fun part, um, the, the survival function plot, where we break out the time to failure, 
um, by the different prior record score categories. And I think the main, there's like kind of a couple of takeaways here, but for one, there's definitely some different categories, right? There's, this is um, the number of months that a person goes without recidivating. Um, and then this is the survival rate or the reciprocal of the recidivism rate. So at first, everybody's doing good. Um, by the time you get to about a year, you know, you've got like 20 or 30 percent of people who are recidivated. Um, and then by the time you get to the end of the three years, um, you're talking 50 or 60 percent of the people who are recidivated. But uh, folks with a prior record score of nothing um, had the best outcomes. Folks with a prior record score of a five or an RFL had the worst outcomes. So that's what you sort of think and follow along. Um, but one of the problems is we've got seven, there's actually eight, but there's so few people in the eighth category that couldn't model it. So I'm modeling seven of the prior record score categories. And you really, I would say you only have four really distinct trends here. You can make an argument that that's distinct enough. It's statistically significant, but they're pretty close. Um, but sort of the problem areas are that people with a prior record score of three and four overlap and that was reflected in the non-statistically significant funding from the table uh, and people in a prior record score of five and six uh, also basically overlap all right so we're punishing these people under the guidelines um, for more time for each of these seven categories even though their risk of recidivism is the same for some groupings which would suggest if you really wanted to treat the prior record score as a as a risk tool um, that you would want to clearly delineate that each category has a, a separate risk of recidivism overall compared to the other categories, and that's not really what was going on here. Another thing um, that I, I did was to, I called them counterfactuals, but I thought, all right, so if we have the current prior record score um, and we treat it like a sort of a risk assessment, um, and we can evaluate it on some kind of metric, then how would it compare to a system where instead of all those columns and all the points and fours and threes and all the things that we count, all we did was compare, do you have any prior record versus no prior record, just a binary. Um, and then these are all independent of each other. Um, what if instead of counting all those things, we didn't count them. We just gave them, you know, you get one, two, three, four, five, regardless of the severity, unweighted count. But what if we kicked out the misdemeanors, the lower level misdemeanors. Now, what if we kicked out the juvenile adjudications? Um, and so using this uh, area under the curve analysis, which is um, where you ask the question, if we could know the people who would be recidivists and non-recidivists, and you randomly chose one recidivist and one non-recidivist. And we can do this because we have this retrospective data that has recidivism information in it. Um, so we sort of cheat and are able to do it. If you randomly pick a recidivist and a non-recidivist, what percentage of the time would the recidivist have a higher score than the non-recidivist? And if your score is really good, then you would hope it would be a pretty high percentage. You could flip a coin and you would be right half the time. So if a score is not at least 50%, then it's in the wrong direction. So 50% uh, is like useless because you got a coin that can do that. Um, uh, so you want something more than that. All right. So the current prior record score had an ADC of 0.59, which means it does 9% better than chance in being able to identify whether a person was at a higher risk or not. Um, if uh, almost all of that, though, is just based on the difference between whether you had any prior record score or none. So if we just had the binary one, um, you still have an 8% improvement over the chance. Uh, if we just counted up instead of waiting, it was not statistically significant. So the waiting doesn't do anything to help the prediction. Um, if we kicked out all the misdemeanors, so in the reform world, some people are like, we shouldn't be counting these misdemeanors against people forever. Uh, if we did that, we dropped prediction by just one percentage point. Um, and then if we dropped the ju juvenile adjudication, um, you would lose two percentage points of, um, of prediction. Okay, so on the, on the timing thing, there's other good evidence um, that maybe things shouldn't count forever, including some work that um, Megan Krilichek did with two, two articles. I only have one of them up here, but the other one was um, the, not the mark of a record, 
Do you remember what it was called? No, but we won't ask. Uh, okay. <laughs> Another, it was two years later. It was data. It's not the official title. And it was in like crime and delinquency or something. Um, okay, but two two studies using uh, using two different cohort data sets, which found similar results, which were that um, oh after a certain amount of time, like. It, a couple years after a contact with the police, um, the contact with the police is highly predictive of um, of another uh, recidivism event. But after six or seven years, it doesn't perfectly match. But if a person has gone six or seven years without an offense, um, then by that time, their uh, their likelihood of a future offense starts to approach um, the, uh, the average person who didn't have the prior contact, which might lead you to think that maybe we should lapse things or stop counting them um, after some amount of time instead of holding uh, holding them against a person forever. Uh, okay, and so I just want to come back to this. I think this suggests, at least in this one jurisdiction, that the prior record score here does, it doesn't do a horrible job. I mean, there's a trend there, but it could be tweaked to do a better job, and we are imposing more punishment on some categories of people, even though those categories don't all reflect a higher level of risk of recidivism, even if they did, is there any reason to think that when we punish a person with a category two for a year longer than a category one, that we're getting any return on our investment for that? So does it deter that person from future criminal involvement? Does it generally deter other people. I think the best evidence currently from people like Dan Nagan and quite a few studies in the last 10 years suggests that there's no marginal increase in deterrence for a marginal increase in sentence length. And then in fact, putting people in prison for longer may actually have a criminogenic effect and people who do longer sentences are more likely to commit crime. Um, so don't try telling that to policymakers, but uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's like that's what we find, right? So you'd actually be doing a better good for recidivism by giving people shorter sentences instead of longer ones. Um, it certainly incapacitates people for that certain, you know, for that amount of time. Uh, but I think the really kind of the consensus view on incapacitation was uh, was a limited incapacitation, right? Incapacitation is costly. And it, I mean, if if you're talking about repeat child predators or murderers, like we, the the stakes are too high. So we will incapacitate people for 30 years when when the you know the stakes are so high. But the notion that you'd have like short term incapacitation of two years and then let a person back out on the street who's now at a higher risk of recidivism than when they went in because of the criminogenic is just odd. And I don't think people have really expressed um, uh, incapacitation. In, in that way. Um, all right, so I want to. I'm going to do one more, uh, and then I'm going to. I'm going to stop for um, questions and make sure we have at least 15 minutes for questions. And I'm just going to leave. I'm not going to make it all the way through here, um, but I just because the other thing when you talk about um, risk of recidivism and you get through that conversation, the next thing that pops in a lot of people's minds naturally um, would be, well, even if they're not riskier, like people who have continued to commit crimes just deserve more punishment. Um, and so I've done some work, I won't talk about all of it, um, but a few things to just question that notion of whether people who have committed crimes in the past just deserve more punishment for the fact that they've committed crimes in the past. One, if you go back to the early retributivists, people like Hegel, I was reading this and reminded of it the other day, use phrases like the crime has been canceled. So if a crime has been canceled, why is it being uncanceled all of a sudden through this guideline provision? Uh, I'm not sure if it matches up. Um, we have uh, legal rules in America, but the, there's a notion that it's fine if you don't like me. Um, and that maybe I've done something that a person, you know, the status of me as a person you disapprove of and you don't want to have a beer with me and you don't like me. But we can't punish people for status. You can't punish a drug addict for being a drug addict. You can punish them for using drugs or having possession of drugs, but not for the status of being an addict. And so even if we don't like people because of their prior record and you don't want them dating your daughter or whatever, I mean, maybe it'd be cool if you did, but even if you don't, it doesn't mean that you, mean you just can't put them in jail because they were punished in the past. So, um, so why isn't it just another form of status punishment when we punish a person more 
when they've been reconvicted for a new crime. And there's a lot to say here, uh, and I won't, other than to say retributive scholars just cannot agree on what to do here. And they spent a lot of time thinking about it. And some of them say prior record just doesn't, shouldn't matter for sentencing. A burglar, second degree, no person in the home, they did this much damage, whether they've got six prior felonies or none, they should be judged on what they did and what they're here to be held accountable for today. Some people actually, this is a minority view, but some people actually think that you should get less punishment when you have a prior record, maybe just to be contrarian and an academic. Um, but the, the just like what they say is that, look, if you come into the court and you get sanctioned and we're supposed to rehabilitate you and do something to help you, and if you keep coming back, we've failed you. And so it's actually more our fault than it is your fault. I don't know if people are like signing up for that one or not, but anyway, uh, it's out there and people like write serious articles about it. Um, and then finally, there are people who think it should increase, but there's no real good, clear justification for why it should increase. Um, there's one kind of good theory that I think fits with a lot of this stuff, but rather than continuing to talk, um, I'm just gonna call it quits there and make sure there's plenty of time. Um, to allow people to engage and ask questions. So anyway, it's been a pleasure. It's a lot of fun to be back in Pennsylvania in State College. We are Penn State, um, mm -hmm. even when we live other places. Actually, um, well, I won't tell that story. But there's a, like a cool connection between Pennsylvania and Philadelphia um, and Thomas Green, who gave the land for the land grant institution of Clemson University. Um, so I feel like there's a kindred connection there anyway. And we both have paws. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so anyway, thanks for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Um, look forward to chatting after and hearing any questions that anybody has. Thanks. So well, first of all, I, I feel old because I had to look up the name of my own article. Sorry. <laughs> Long term crimes assistance and recidivism patterns. <laughs> that was the other one. We there you go. There was a third, but I didn't look up that. Um I want to thank you so much for being here. This is very informative. I have a couple questions of my own, but I'm going to open up the floor here first and hold mine till the end. Enjoy. Doctor, and I will go back online. and forth. Dr. Elmer has online. Yeah, Dr. Yes. Um, wonderful talk, and you are um, you are clearly the guy <laughs> when it comes to prior record and understanding what it does and what it should do. Um, I just wanted to ask, get your thoughts on what strike your your area under the curve analysis. Mm -hmm. what, what strikes me is just how bad that is. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's nine percent better than a coin flip. It sucks, um, and yet we use it as we treat it as if it's a real recidivism reducer or you know crime prevention tool. Um, and judges think of it that way. We talk to them, um, and you know, judges. Most judges I've talked to really you know believe that yeah prior record really matters you know it's really important um given that but then we also have in you know this day and age we have risk assessment mm -hmm. um what i just like your your thoughts on you know if we want to if we want to address risk should we just use risk assessment should Maybe we should get rid of prior record and just use risk assessment, or is risk assessment I have just as many problems? Or you know, what is the compare and contrast prior record and risk formal? Yeah, contrast? sure. Yeah, well, thank you for those comments. And if you pick something obscure enough, um, you know, you too maybe can be the expert in the area that nobody else cares about. Uh, but those happen to be the two things that I spend most of my time in research on: are cr uh, criminal history and then also risk assessment because of my time here. Um, in forced labor on the risk assessment project that <laughs> lasted for so long. Uh, but it's a cool question, all right? So in risk assessment, which I know a lot of you probably know, but risk assessment tools will often use all sorts of information and they're really controversial and interesting to think about in the criminal justice context. Um, some of them use things like, I mean, they all use age and criminal history. Um, some of them use the gender of the person. Um, some of them use things like, you know, family dynamic kinds of variables and work employment. I mean, all sorts of things. So I think the question of how palatable that would be depends on how much of a problem you have with whatever factors might be going in to the risk assessment tool. And there are some, 
Well, I'm working on a project now that Megan mentioned um, where our area under the curve is about 0.8, which is really quite high for a risk assessment tool um, used on human people because humans are just hard to predict, right? I mean, there's a certainty. It's not like um, it's not like a hard science. So 0.8 is like about as good as I've seen. Um, 0.58, I think I would, uh, or 0.59, <laughs> to quote Jeff Ulmer, kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, maybe we're using it for different purposes and there's retribute, you know, but, um, but yeah, so I think I love the thought of this idea because we certainly could do better than 0.59. And if that's really what we care about, is that what we should, is that what we should be doing? Like come up with the best risk tool, if that's what you're saying you want, and let's impose, um, you know, a, and we can it be transparent. You could, you know, you could know what portions uh, of a person's recommended punishment were attributable to what portion, you know, like their age. But that's one of the controversial things, right? So age is huge. Young people have a really higher risk than people who are older. So would you feel comfortable laying a grid in front of a judge and saying, all right, this 20 year old, this 18 year old, often minority kid is gonna be punished the most. But once we get to these old timers, you know, we'll cut their punishment in half because that's essentially what, you know, whatever the numbers are, that's what you'd be doing with the risk assessment. You'd be directly injecting age, um, certainly. I mean, we that would be the next thing we would add with criminal history. And honestly, it probably would be double the prediction and it would be just fine. I mean, uh, uh, something in the high 60s is pretty normal and pretty good for a risk assessment tool and, and probably just those two factors would get you there. I think there are a lot of people who would bristle at, um, at explicitly using age, especially because of, you know, the young minority kind of problem and the, um, and the, yeah, the, all the, all the, uh, the fairness issues that might come along with it. But I do think it's pretty interesting. And it also probably matters um, how much punishment you're talking. I didn't really get, I don't, mean to like try to sneak this in but i just want to make sure that um everybody at least has a clue of what's going on under the eighth edition version of the pennsylvania guidelines now dramatically changed their approach to criminal history i mean there's still a grid and there's columns and there's numbers so it's not that different maybe but you can you'll be able to see this great but they more or less um limited it to uh doubling across the grid instead of it was an eight times increase under the old proposal. So this is pretty substantial. Um, and this version has just four columns, so they shrank the columns um, and they might've opened it back up to five columns now, Matt, but uh, still less than eight. Um, so I think it, you know, to me that would matter, right? Like if you had one long range and said, this person should get 12 to 24, and by the way, here's their risk assessment. They're 78% likely to reach recidivate versus 24, instead of tying it to a specific number that, that I can go, because he's a 21 year old, he's at this level instead of this other level. Um, so I'm not sure if I personally would be super comfortable, even though I think it's a really interesting idea um, to, to replace a prior record score with a risk assessment score. So do we have questions online or should I go to the room? Go to the room, please. Do nothing. Questions from the room? I have no one else. Um, I was wondering if you like kind of considered a bench site um, and kind of how that leads into the risk of the by like the study drug offenders and they kind of have a higher rate of recidivism and things like that. So they might be less serious severity. Um, sure. If that kind of affects the predictions or anything like that. I think it does, and some maybe it wouldn't be counterintuitive to you, but it's counterintuitive to some people that, for example, the higher the severity of the offense, you actually go down in your likelihood of recidivism. Because a lot of times, it's how you know aggravated assault. You get in a fight at a bar over a girlfriend with your best friend, and if you know you'd had one less drink, that might not have happened. Um, so uh, with violent crimes, a lot of times, or more serious crimes, they're almost you know, their happenstance or random or, um, but lower level crimes, like people who are engaged in drug trafficking, it's not like they just like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to traffic in drugs today or not. Like it's something that they do. Or if you are churning through like lower level thefts, you, that's just, you know, it's more part of, so um, people at those lower levels are more likely to recidivate than people at more dangerous, higher levels. Um, and we, we know that that's, that's true. Um, 
I, I didn't do any specific analysis to just look at it, but it's so anyway, it's controlled for in the model. And I, I do think it's uh, interesting. But it's also interesting to think about the stakes, which is that recidivism, right? You, what does that mean? Like, do I get stopped because I got a joint in my pocket and I got an arrest and now I'm a recidivist versus something that we probably care a lot more about that happens a lot less frequently. Like we want to know if you attempted a murder, like let's count that one for sure, right? Uh, and that's what policymakers want to know. They want to know violent recidivism, but it's a lot harder to predict because uh, it happens a lot less often. Uh, but it's a really important distinction to make. What are the stakes of recidivism that you're talking about? Good question. I actually have two questions, so I'm going to ask one now okay. and then maybe follow up with a second with you after. Okay, yeah, cool. So you talk about a lot about recidivism um, and you've talked a lot about how race and ethnicity is. Well, you haven't used the word based. I'm going to say based. Sure. Right? Because we make decisions in our society about where we put police and who they're going to stop and frisk and who's going to get a prior record. So when we use prior record as a punishment factor, is there even in a risk assessment, right? Not just prior record, but the risk assessment. How can we, any ideas you might have, how do we how do we unpack that from where we put police, who gets arrested, who gets the conviction? Because you can you can measure recidivism as an arrest, conviction, right, you know, recommitment. How do, how do we unpack that in a way that really then defines risk of an individual versus societal policy. Yeah, it's a great question. Great question. If you can answer it, you get the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm interested in your ideas. I'll take home no prizes, but there's three thoughts that I have okay. uh, from that. One of them is I have actually seen some people because this this is very salient, right? So in risk tools, um, this question, I'm going through it now with the Department of Justice on whether the pattern tool should count um, or should count as an outcome of recidivism, uh, recidivism, a rearrest or a, a narrower reconviction under the idea that um, over policing and you know bad arrest could be counted and minorities would be more disadvantaged of that, at least restricting it to a conviction would, um, would put into place some of the due process protection of the criminal justice system. So one thing you can do is focus on um, narrower outcomes like conviction versus arrest where we think there's less bad discretionary decisions being made. Um, another thing that I've seen some people with risk assessment do that I think is kind of cool is so you try to come up with an estimate of what the, um, I'm gonna use this, I wish I could think of a better term right now, but like an over-policing coefficient, right? So if we think, all right, um, African-American individuals have uh, an outcome rate of this and white individuals have an outcome rate of this. Let's assume we think that's not because of differences in behavior, but it's because of differences in policy and policing. So if African-Americans are um, have a 20% worse outcome, let's impute a 20% adjustment to the score that they're getting. That gets pretty controversial in terms of like equal protection and whether those um, assumptions are met, but it's at least something that you could tangibly do to adjust the score based on um, based on what's what's going on there. Anyway, uh, I think it's a, and the other thing, I think in the sentencing context is just go, if we can think of five ways why criminal history should matter, how it could matter less, let's stop counting forever. Let's stop counting after seven years and let it lapse. Let's not quadruple or quintuple or octuple. Let's just, you know, add 20 or 30 percent. Let's shrink the magnitude. Um, can we get rid of juvenile offenses if there's a correlation between um, minority offenders and juvenile records, which there certainly is, um, lower level misdemeanors, like what are some ways that you can make it matter less, and if you can make it matter less, then to the extent that um, race and prior record are correlated, you're making the impact of the race part less. Um, and I think if that's justified, which I think I personally think it is, but um, that's what the talk is about. Um, then, you know, that's, I think we should do that. Any, any way that we can tolerate less impact on prior record, then um, it's going to have all those things that were negative unintended consequences, you'll get better results, right? We'll get less people in prison because there's less people with prior record. We'll still be targeting people who are um, high, high level violent, you know, like if you're a murderer, you're going to go in for a long time. We're not changing that. 
um, but prison prioritization would be would be benefited and uh, the racial disparities and we do anything we can I think is my my thought is like if we can uh, reduce unwarranted disparities by a small amount then let's do it and if we can do it by a large amount then let's do that um, but mitigate well, we're never going to be perfect but let's get progress but you could do right? better right yeah but Matt and I would say that progress is you can't let per perfection right and with Matt is spearheading what will be certainly a very interesting analysis on how the um, the current version of the guidelines versus the new um, proposal for eighth edition guidelines, along with Jordan, um, uh, uh, how some impacts. Oh, yeah. And also <laughs> um, everybody, <laughs> like 25 percent of you are involved in this project and I'm trying to mansplain to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, but th this will be really interesting to see how the new version of the guidelines are going to look at uh, a lot of impact analysis, um, including on racial disparities. Maybe. It's one o'clock. Anything else? Last question from the room or online? I just want to make a one quick observation and quote or something that uh, my my sentencing uh, my sentencing scholarship father used to say, John Kramer. Um, and, uh, you know, he used to say, when he was director of the Sentencing Commission, he, he used to say, you have no idea the bad things that are prevented from happening. Yeah. Like, and so I think there, there's value in what you just said. Like, you know, if you can prevent more harm, you know, if you can not attain perfection, but get a little more justice, you know, a little more harm reduction, that's a very big thing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.